morning. Good morning. Oh, we're resetting. There we go. Let's make sure we're on the right Wi-Fi. Okay, I think we should be good. Let me get some of these unused applications shut down. I love when it tells me, hey, shut down some of that stuff you got going on. This is my accountability measure for those of you who are like me and keep up 16 tabs. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Jackie Glass, Mama, Navy Vet, Certified Doer, and your Laced Up Legislator for the House of Elliott's 89th District. It is Tuesday, August 9th, and here we are, right? back at it again. It has been a packed week and I think we've got so much more in store. Let me get my notes together so we can so we can chop it up. Um, chop it up today. So if you haven't already just wanted to like give a couple reminders that this week is our second to last week for um, for certified doer summer school right so this is going to be a great opportunity for you guys to good morning good morning great opportunity for you guys to get engaged on the legislative process this this week we are talking about lobbying now even if you didn't go through the process of building a bill with us right so we've got a several several scholars in certified doer summer school that have, are in the process of building bills doing their outreach um, even if you did not get to do that this this um this particular class this week we are going to be going through how you advocate for something that you'd like to see so lobbying is essentially it's not a dirty word y'all <laughs> good morning lobbying is not a dirty word it's something that we do to make sure that what it is that we want to see gets done good morning miss Rosalind. <laughs> that's my neighbor right next door <laughs> um but that's that's super important. So if you haven't already, let's it's in the in the the notes. Go ahead and sign up for summer school either this Thursday evening from six to eight or on Saturday morning from nine to eleven. You got two opportunities to get in there, and we can talk about how we lobby and how we do those sorts of good things. Um, secondly, if you have not subscribed to our newsletter, we are trying to expand our reach, right? We try to give out a lot of good information and just keep people abreast of what it is that I'm actually doing because you should want to know. Well, you should know. Even if you don't want to know, you should at least know what the heck is, am I up to as your uh, elected official. Um, so that's an opportunity to stay uh, in check with what we got going on, but also let your neighbors know. Like this is, let your, let your people know. Uh, that this is something that we're that we do every single month that's I think the newsletter comes out next week okay um, and I'd love to know if you guys have any events coming up or anything going on drop it in the chat you know this more these mornings as I know I've been the main talker these are actually for you so if you have questions comments concerns Go ahead and throw them in the chat. I'll, I'll do my very best to answer them. Um, I do my very, very best to answer the questions as I as I as I as I see them in the chat. All right, so I'm gonna get to notes. And if you sent me something, <laughs> that's if you sent me something, I didn't get it. Um, um, here we go. All right, so this past weekend, they, we every first Saturday of the month. Um, the Democratic Party has what is called the breakfast, right? We go to Queen's Boss the first Saturday of the month and we have a uh, breakfast where all of the elected officials that are part of the party, which, you know, sometimes I have a little, I feel some type of way because I want to make sure that I get a hold of everybody. I'm silencing this phone. Um, that um, everybody gets the opportunity to speak. So you, they start off with our federal congressman, Scott typically is there. Um, state and then local uh, and it got a little tense and when we started talking about educators right and and police and crime and all the things that we've um, that we are sort of dealing with right in our face um, 
right here in our own backyard and just really got me to thinking you know where where does responsibility lie there's two things happening here is that we are you know crime isn't able to be prosecuted because there aren't enough officers to fill out police reports and then some officers can't go to certain scenes and then we've got this um, extensive use of our force in particular parts of the city uh, without really the acknowledgement of what has been happening in other parts we've lost a great deal of our community resource officers meaning those um, folks that were within the community sort of building that goodwill those guys are they are gone uh, they are back on the beat with regards to and the quality of life and culture within the within police departments is low it's it's substandard so that's real right so you've got issues on the inside issues on the outside um, causing the greater public as well as the employees to to suffer that's real right that same thing is happening with educators right um, lots of vacancies <laughs> across the state um, not being you know paid with dignity valued in a way and um, valued valued as a profession I think we've, we haven't done that very well overall um, you know, relational wise, you know, are we co-parenting with our educators the way in which we used to or, or uh, and I, I believe that that's still a yes. I think the louder voices are getting, um, are, are, are drowning out other folks on this one. But where I'm at, and this is, I really want this to be a conversation, um, is, is the so what, now what? Because here's what's going to happen. Here's what we have, like, legislatively, so that you can understand my picture on some of this. Now, forgive me, I'm, I got my notes here. Um, but in the Commonwealth, there's going to be, continue to be a massive shortage on police as uh, there was a 2020 law that passed uh, a series of, of, of police reform measures, right? So I'm going to, just for scope, you guys, I'm going to talk about police, I'm going to talk about educators, and then I want us to come together on the so what, now what just on the two pressing issues that will be affecting the Manning as it pertains to our police force and our educational force. So 2020, there were these laws that passed that sort of, that brought in the criteria uh, for decertification, right? Uh, so this means when, you know, that an officer would lose their certification to be able to be, be a police officer. Uh, so it expanded to include officers who are fired or resign as a result of misconduct, um, including excessive use of force uh, or actions that compromise their credibility, integrity, or honesty. So what's happened is two out of two out of every three certifications that took place under the new criteria since 2020 were instituted and cite credibility, integrity, or honesty clause for at least one reason of the decertification, which the majority with the majority specifying the, um, that document falsification or lying in an internal investigation uh, had occurred. Now, I'm going to underscore document falsification as we have brought forth legislation last year, um, probably one of my most pressing bills that we brought forth. I, th I think it's House Bill, um, House Bill 1081, uh, which would have barred officers made it illegal for them to make false documents and so now we're losing you know because there's a gray area at least in my opinion right because there's a gray area we're losing the force because folks think it is still okay to falsify documents or, or you know falsify documents or lie in an internal um, investigation and you know that's knowing this guys I just when we get the opportunity once we get the legislation together you all will see our public safety package that we have for next session so the change was backed by a number of people and and you know actually would help start preventing officers who have been fired by one department for a violation but being rehired hired by another department in another state and so officers but previously before this officers were able to resign from the department uh, to prevent a complete investigation of misconduct. So you would be like, nah, I'm out, peace, deuces, um, um, before that, that that investigation could be done. And so there is a shrinking of in the force, right? Because uh, what, a, what a, a lot of what accountability does, specifically in this area, 
may cause us to lose some folks. Now in the same, because those are subjective, you know, there, there's that culture too with the police department, like, hey, this is who's determining what those things are. Let me see what we have in the chat here. Hold on, sorry, got two windows open here. Um, so yeah, the te teachers are picketing and it, it's getting real. Yeah, they're picketing and they want something different. Uh, these are the law enforcement, yeah. These are the law enforcement standards we have to ensure the force or bad actors move literally, uh, move laterally to policing again unethically. Yeah, so yeah, that they don't do that. We don't, that's not what we want. But we're holding in our, our hands, recognizing that that is shrinking our force. So however you want to slice it, however you feel about it, it is. Um, and, and it, you know, I built the school of thought that we do need fair and impartial policing. We need police that are going to be doing, but we also need help in reimagining how we can do this, right? And I need to pull up my reimagining document because we talked a bit about what are the next steps. If you haven't gotten the opportunity to take a look at it, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pull it up. It's uh, the 21st, 21st century, uh, uh, policing report that was put out by the White House um, some years ago. Hold on. Um, it really uh, helped me um, get a get a um, scope of what's happening. So President Obama back then, um, met with a task force that um, that established this he threw an executive order task force specifically on policing. So let me get the report, um, final report, right? Let's get this to you guys so that you have it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get this to you guys. This was the final report that was submitted and has how we reimagine these things. Now let's hold that in our hands with our educators as well, right? So when we go over and we start talking about our educators, we know that that across the district, across, across the Commonwealth, y'all, uh, there are a number of spots that uh, have not been filled and that day by day districts are sort of they are racing to fill these positions and it's likely that thousands thousands do you hear me thousands of, of spots are not going to be filled so the Virginia Department of Education um, staffing and vacancy report they listed uh, more than 25 hundred unfilled teaching positions across the state and so some divisions um, have also reported a spike in uh, the most recent current the most recent school year and what do we know <laughs> right what do we know about this uh, education groups have have let us know and this is the fire that I think we saw on Saturday about edu about this is the fire that we saw from many of the folks at the Democratic breakfast is that the education groups say some factors contributing to the shortage have been decades in the making, especially when it comes to the historically low p teacher pay. There was a 2019 analysis uh, by the Economic Policy, and I'm getting this, for this, these are two stories that came straight out of the Virginia Mercury. So the, the uh, Economic Policy Institute ranked Virginia, okay? ranked Virginia as the last, this is in 2019, as last in the country in terms of the teacher wage penalty. And that's a measure that refers to the gap in weekly salaries between teachers and other college ed educated profession. So in 2019, we were the absolute freaking worst. And, do you, and we can, we're running from behind. Um, and that leads me sort of to the so what, now what? So what, now what? Um, what I've been thinking about over the past few days is, you know, how do we, right, how do we do two things? We hear out our educators and our law enforcement in a very real way uh, because I know that I have the opportunity to take forth uh, legislation and to have a mic and to do these things. How do we hear them out um, clearly and loudly so that, um, that we're able to take some action. Here's the deal. Let me just be really honest with you. Is I think they told us exactly what it is that they need. And we were just working from a surplus. And it's going to get real scarce when you got money. 
we had money in this last budget to do some really, really good things, right? Um, and I don't think our investments were big enough in these two things, and recognizing that we are still in a place where we are politicizing educators and law enforcement. And I think as a, as a whole, we need to cut that, cut that, right? We need to cut that. Granted, I don't know that we're leading the efforts of politicizing them in that way, but two of the hardest jobs uh, with the highest expectations, um, with the greatest connection to our cultural norms and our uh, quality of life, particularly with parents and communities, um, with communities and, and people, excuse me, are law enforcement and educators. Yep, um, um, Isabel says it's impossible to urge young people to go into debt to get their degrees and teach and they cannot pay off their loans with a sustainable pay. You're absolutely right. Um, Isabel, something I, um, as I'm building out the mission for advocacy, these are uh, things that I don't think I'll be able to get done in the next year or two or three, uh, but building out advocacy, I'm wondering, um, if there can be a you know programs where we are able to help educators with if, if what I'm finding the problem is is that we've been talking about teacher pay for as long as I can remember and so what are the other things that we can provide to educators to um, improve their quality of life and take some of that burden off of them um, there was a program here at one point where educators could uh, move into certain neighborhoods and be able to get uh, support with housing, right? Either I think if their down payment would pay, pay, was paid, I'm gonna have to um, make sure that I look into it. Uh, but I know that I know an educator here who now left the country, let's just be honest, left the country, rightfully so, left the country um, and, and was an educator at Booker T. So. I, I'm wondering if there's a way that we can help with a housing cost, right? What are the other things that we can do that would support and just provide dignity to the profession, particularly with educators? And we've tried to have the conversation about um, college being too damn high, <laughs> too damn high, uh, and we're still going to see a three percent increase in um, in tuition. Yep, too far, too much. Too much, and, and and that's and we can say the same thing. And as Isabel said, teachers are tasked with far too much, um, and not enough support to do their job. That same thing is happening to our law enforcement officers, right? Um, as we look at pulling other specialties into the department, they're asked to be first responders to middle mental health um, um, crisis. They're asking you're asking them to show up and um, and be able to be a resource manager. We're asking. Yep, you're asking a lot, and then we're asking our teachers to do all the things, <laughs> and then and then here have some more as we change the standards. Uh, absolutely, yep, Shar, Shar, Shar. That's I know that there's a program. It was for educators and police, and I'm 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 want to look into that, and I'm wondering for me, and just so that you guys can get a scope of like what I can do, is I'm trying to figure out what is it, what departments do we need to talk to at the state level that allow us to do things like uh, funding, to do things like that, to help educators and help police in a very meaningful way. Because it doesn't feel good, like right, crime doesn't feel good. The other night, um, I'll be quite honest with you, with you what, I'm, what I am struggling with right now is, you know, like I've been hearing a lot of gunshots. I mean, that is, that's real. Um, my son had an incident where somebody flashed their gun to him <laughs> recently and um, in, and and yo know, and we've got to do better and we've got we've got to do better on both fronts because where where i think we crumble as a community is when we don't have these two very critical infrastructure pieces uh taken care of and um f supported and uh foundationally uh solid in our communities because we do ask a lot of, of our educators and police they are our they are co-parents they are they are our safety nets 
Yep, community, school to community pipelines. And I'd love for you to, Vince, I love that school to me. What does that look like? Because we're asking a lot of, of people uh, too, um, but we recognize that we, many hands, it's gonna take many hands to do this better. Let me look at what some of you guys are um, um, saying. Um, yeah, we refer kids, not enough to school counselors. There's no meaningful support for our kids. Uh, to have their needs met according to NPR national standards set one school psychologist for 400 for four 500 students NPS uh, is not even remotely close to that yeah yeah uh, thanks thank you Jay I appreciate it you know we are it's real <laughs> it's real he was in a program and those things are real um, what does that look like because I think to to um, Isabel's point is uh, who wants to take that risk of setting themselves up for a uh, life of hardship, right? How do I be a teacher and or a police officer and build a family? How do I, how do I do that and be a part of community? We're not necessarily looking at this from pathways perspective, and I think that's where we have to go. Is if these are two important institutions, these are two important. Uh, roles in our community how do we curate pathways for that and I think it's several folds right it's the education piece of, of, of the debt incurred to be such a great service to society um, how do we how do we take some of the how do we incentivize that um, as a military member there's a program called troops to teachers right that incentivizes incentivize military folks to go from from military to teaching um, and, and they helped pay for the schooling and certifications and process and got you all set up to be to walk yourself into that profession is there is there are there uh, roads like that for policing knowing that we have new policing accountability standards because what I don't want you to get in your head or anyone to get in their head is that we don't need accountability, right? It, it, accountability is going to take away, right? Like I said, it's taking off. We're losing a lot of police officers because of these uh, accountability standards. But when you had a profession that has gone unchecked for so long, reform is not going to feel real good. With educators, when you've had a profession that has been devalued for so long and folks are now finding that they can have their value in, ever, in other places, it's not going to feel good when they don't want to be a part of that institution. And we can't get mad at educators or police officers for wanting a better, for wanting a good quality of life on the job because they are directly interacting with us as a public. So I've got five minutes left here. And um, I did say I was going to get to the, uh, get to the, so what, now what? And I'm going to pull open my, um, yeah, so, um, to help, you know, with, uh, with safety, but these two things, hold on, I'm pulling up my stuff. Um, how do we make space for cooperation and coalition between communities and police and communities and educators? while providing everybody space to do the right thing, right? Um, I do believe it does come from um, putting our money where our mouth is and valuing these, uh, um, these professions, period. So as we work and look, I'm telling you, I'm a, this is an invitation as, as we work and sort of think about what does it look like, um, what does it look like to be, um, supportive what does it look like for us to build systems that work with bringing people in specifically in our community um, I'm thinking about what sort of pathways we can create to alleviate costs because what it boils down to right now is uh, we don't have competitive pay uh, but we also have a culture that is substandard yeah the, substandard I'm looking at you guys in the chat here just making sure so when you have some time asymmetrical support when you have some time asymmetrical yeah I'm interested in knowing what that is and asymmetrical support system like now we have to be discussed uncomfortably 
uh, as well no pressure but there are some of us working this angle that would be humbled and considered if you had ability ability to strategically plan and build a base of volunteers for the input got it um, about two weeks ago uh, MPD was called about a young person mental health distress possible suicide they never showed up yep uh, Char Charlotte would eight would uh, so here's the deal with that um, with uh, 988 988 is they are to, so um, Isabel asked what about 988 for that distress call for that young person you're absolutely right that um, that 988 is 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 probably the better call consider considering what our police force is at right now however um, 988 works with knows how to call in call in um, the police department when necessary so those systems should work um, work in tandem, but do put that in your back pocket um, because they will be able to um, make that phone call. Nine, let me let me explain. Nine eight eight. Nine eight eight is now a new mental health resource um, um, line where if there is someone in a mental health crisis, that is the number that you can call to get support, whether it's directly to. Uh, whether it's making that connection to police, but they will provide the resources to help that person in crisis and get you through it. It is a good thing to have in your back pocket, 988, as well as 211 for any other resources that you guys may need. So here is my ask, right? I want you all to think about, and, and we are thinking about this too as a team. Our team is thinking about what does it look like to create pathways to, people say workforce development, but, um, this is really genuinely community building because these these two professions are are essential to building good communities outside of the people that are directly in them. Um, it is going to take some work. It is going to take some investment. And if if I know anything that uh, if if I if I'm attuned to anything and I realize that uh, we talk about that investment piece, but doesn't matter who's in control do we ever really do enough and what is enough right when I hear fully fund I'm wondering what is that number how do we get to that number and and how do we chip away at these sorts of things but this is an opportunity because right now crime is not is it's where we're gonna go back to school right where we're getting ready to within the next couple weeks we're back to school um, we're seeing we're seeing crime right in you know right in front of our faces right we're right in our backyards um, but we want people to value the struggles not just um, in particular places but in our entire uh, space of livelihood so so what now what is I want you to reach out let's start let's start tr strategically finding ways or partnerships because I do believe this is an all policy if there's a way to build something like troops to teachers just within our city that that supports like the program that was previously had for uh, for educators and police then let's let's get on it let's be good advocates and good stewards to it because that's what we're here for uh, while I can't force anyone to do anything I definitely can be on the same team on the side on the side of doing the greatest good for for our great communities um, I'd love to hear more about the asymmetric support system. I think um, I heard that you were supposed to get on my calendar, so we'll follow up about that. Um, until next time, I hope you guys are able to make today a great day. Let's hold in our hands uh, this real responsibility. Um, I'm grateful for you all just showing up this morning, um, and I look forward to chopping up with you at summer school or Thursday morning prior to summer school. Take care.